Older to Norman at the end of the summer, I was driving down I-70 and all of a sudden, this is the middle of the summer, temperatures were in the 70s. It had been 100. Driving down the road, temperatures in the, in the 70s, and uh, there's a funnel cloud. Go figure, it's in the land spot. Very, very common. <coughs> funnel clouds occur not only in supercell storms and in non-supercell <coughs> storms, but they also occur from orographic wave clouds. And this was from uh, several years ago, and I'm up at, uh, for those of you that know the area, um, I'm at the summit of twist, uh, Twisted Sisters. <laughs> <laughs> Twin Sisters, which uh, is just an easy, easy hike north of, uh, northwest of Boulder, and I was watching wave clouds, and all of a sudden, funnel clouds formed. And what happens is you get this tremendous turbulent motion in the wave cloud, and sometimes it gets stretched into, into a funnel. So another type of funnel cloud, not a tornado. We also see funnel clouds coming from the most innocuous looking clouds. This is a high base cumulus cloud along the dry line, and underneath it there's a funnel cloud. And we've seen hundreds and hundreds of these. Uh, these are not tornadoes, but they sure as hell can scare you. But they do, they are funnel clouds. Of course, there are dust devils. I've gone to Arizona chasing dust devils. And you can see dozens of dust devils on a, on a given day. There's a small dust devil up in Nevada. If you get the impression that water spouts and dust devils and tornadoes all are very similar, they are. Yes? Does, what, what is the difference, in, is there a difference between dust devils and the land spout? Uh, is there a difference between dust devils and the land spout? Uh, it's something you can make, you know, make a distinction yeah. Now, land spouts occur under a growing cumulus cloud, and the source of vorticity is pre-existing in the boundary layer. Okay. For a dust devil, uh, you have dry convection. But there are arguments about what the source of vorticity is. Uh, it may be along um, boundaries, as it is sometimes for water spouts, but then some people think that in ordinary, ordinary convection, the sort of convection that gives you the checkerboard of cumulus clouds, mm -hmm. that, you, that, 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 that the um, circulations uh, in the boundary layer that produce, I'm, I'm not saying this very clearly, but there are roles in the boundary layer mm -hmm. and that that could be the source of vorticity and <coughs> dust levels. The answer is not in yet. So I don't know. Another phenomenon, steam devil. This is Lake Thunderbird. This is on the eastern part of, of Norman, big lake. And one day in December of 1989, um, it had been fairly warm. It was 70 degrees uh, in Norman. So I knew the lake temperature was quite warm. The lake temperature was probably, uh, oh, probably in the, in the 60s. But, and this doesn't happen anymore, but back in the olden days, the temperature was below zero. <laughs> Remember when it used to get cold? <laughs> Maybe for New England you still do, but uh, it doesn't get cold in Oklahoma anymore, but it was below zero, and the wind was blowing 40, 50 miles an hour, and I said, I'll bet, there is I'll bet that there's Arctic sea smoke at the lake. So I ran out to the lake, and yes, there was Arctic sea smoke covering the lake, but then we kept getting steam devils, which I think are basically dust devils, uh, you have a super adiabatic lapse rate, instead of over land, it's over the water. And I must tell you, holding a camera and taking, snapping a shutter with bare flesh, when it's below zero and the wind's blowing 40, 50 miles an hour, it's really something. Anyway, I love doing this. When I grew up, when I lived in uh, Boston, I used to get up and drive out to the ocean after a cold outbreak just to look for the Arctic sea smoke. In the beginning days of storm chasing, um, some of you may know Greg Bird, who's at Comet. He's chased with me, Bill McCall at NASA. The first quantitative measurements we made were basically trying to <coughs> take movies, no videos, 16 millimeter movies of tornadoes, and hope to find debris flying. And you could then, if you track the debris across the frames, a successive frames, you could photogrammetrically analyze the motion and estimate the wind speeds. And that what was done for many years. Of course, the problem is you can't see inside the tornado. And look at this tornado. Do you see any debris? 
No. So, oh, we're open country in the Texas Panhandle. So this was not a very good way of trying to measure wind speeds in tornadoes. Then in the early 1980s, uh, Al Bedard at the Wave Propagation Laboratory in Boulder and I devised a, an instrument called TOTO, a 400-pound device which we put in the pickup truck. And the idea was to put this in the path of a tornado. And this is what people are doing routinely now. But back then, this was brand new. Toto, the Totable Tornado Observatory. And if any of you have seen the motion picture Twister, when, before the movie was made, people came to my office. I showed them um, a picture of Toto. I gave them a journal article talking about our scientific results. <coughs> they renamed it Dorothy in the movie, gave us zero credit. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but there it is. Okay, you'll see that in the movie. Go to see the movie Twister again. Anyway, this is a picture of hard mud. There's a major tornado going over Altus Air Force Base. It's moving from southwest to northeast. We place Toto out in the hope that the tornado will come over Toto. What do you think happened? This big tornado came to the northeast and dissipated. A new one formed to the west. All right, so you just moved north and it'll come right towards you, right? Ron, this tornado moved to the northwest. <laughs> so I think tornadoes are intelligent beings. <laughs> Unlike chasers. In the mid-80s, we started to uh, release weather balloons. Now remember, this we had to wait till the mid-80s to, to be able to do this because microprocessors were just coming into to being. And here we are. Uh, Lifting a uh, releasing a balloon. Then in the late 1970s, we used the first uh, portable Doppler radar. This is from the Los, Los Alamos National Laboratory. There are three of my students. You'll note how they're standing between the tornado and me, <laughs> for safety reasons. And this particular tornado, uh, there were two antennas, one's for receiving, one's for transmitting. We can't map out the winds in the tornado with this radar. It only puts out one watt. But we can look at the spectrum, and we can find out what the maximum wind speeds are. So we used this for, for many years. We also flew from aircraft. This is during Vortex 1. This is the NOAA P3. This is the plane that flies into to hurricanes. We headed up to look at severe storms. There's also a similar plane that NCAR has called Eldora. Uh, and this is really not used anymore uh, for, for severe weather. But the antenna was located in the tail section of the plane. I got to go up a number of times. And then in 1993, um, the University of Massachusetts and Amherst built us the first mobile Doppler radar. And this is before the Doppler in wheels. That didn't uh, happen until 1995. It's just that we weren't successful. This is a W-band radar. It operates at a wavelength of three millimeters whereas most uh, mobile Doppler radars operate at X-band, which is three centimeters. And the idea is that you could have a very small antenna and get a very, very fine beam. So with this particular antenna, the beam width is 0 0.18 degrees. So if a tornado is a couple of miles away, our footprint is only about 10 meters across. So we can literally map the winds in someone's house. We know what the winds are in the living room, we know what the winds are in the bathroom, we know what the winds are in the, in the dining room. And this is a tornado that we were probing back in, in 1999. The problem with the W-band radar is attenuation is really severe. And you have to be within 10 kilometers to get any data whatsoever. There's also a bore-sighted video camera mounted 